Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Lord's House. And it's great to have with us David and uh, Ruth Doherty today. Uh, lovely to see you both again. And um, David is leading our services both this morning and this evening. The evening service at half past six. Uh, you will notice that it says after this uh, 6.30 service tonight, it's been followed by the Lord's Supper. I'm afraid that is not true. Uh, it's, um, it should have been taken off from uh, uh, the previous... Uh, the previous um, bulletin. But you will notice in a step towards normality, uh, the pleased to announce that the teas and coffees and biscuits will be served in the back hall after, uh, after the service this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. I uh, hope you can all hear me well. That's great. It's lovely to be here. It's a pleasure for Ruth and myself to be joining you again, and especially to be here on such an auspicious occasion. Um, at our own church over in East Worthing, we're having refreshments after the service for the first time for, well, since time immemorial as well, and um, we're not missing out because you're having refreshments here as well, so that's absolutely wonderful. So it'll be an op great to have the opportunity uh, to chat after the service and, and catch up with news. Uh, it'd be great for Ruth and myself to be able to catch up with your news but I'm sure it'll be great for all of you to catch up with one another's news as well. Um, you know, we've had a rough old couple of years, uh, but I think the one thing which I take as encouragement is the fact that, yeah, 2020 was, was no fun at all, and 2021 was difficult, but, but it was better. And uh, we're now in 2022, and uh, while 2022 is no doubt going to have its challenges, I'm really hopeful and I believe with good reason that it's going to be better than 21 and better than 20. So, you know, we can be optimistic and positive uh, and look forward to good things uh, as well as dealing with the challenges and the difficulties and, and the problems. Um, you know, as Christian people, you know, we ought to be optimists. You know, whatever's happening around us, we ought to be optimists. Uh, because we know that, you know, whatever happens in the here and now, we have good things to look forward to. Um, and, you know, I believe at a human level, we've got good things to look forward to as we look to the future. So let's be encouraged and let's be positive and let's enjoy the refreshments after the service. Uh, we're going to begin our service by singing a hymn together, a hymn that reminds us of, well, one of the reasons why we have good things to look forward. It's because we have a king who is most wonderful. Let's, um, let's stand and let's this, sing this hymn as we begin our service. Thank you. 
be seated. Let's commit our time together to God in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your Son, our Lord Jesus, is the King most wonderful. And Father, we thank you that we can meet together this morning in his name. We can meet together to acknowledge his greatness, to acknowledge the grace of his death, his sacrifice for our sins, to acknowledge his resurrection, uh, to acknowledge his ascension to your right hand, and to recognize that all the blessings that we enjoy from you as the, are the result of all that your son did. Heavenly Father, as we meet together, Father, we pray that you will help us to realize anew the debt that we owe your son for all that he has accomplished at your command on our behalf. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be within our service, that you would guide us in our words and our thoughts. Heavenly Father, you would help us to praise you with a true heart. Heavenly Father, as we bring our prayers and intercessions to you, we pray that you would enable us to do this with confidence and certainty. Heavenly Father, as we think about your word later on in the service, Father, we pray you'd give us open minds and hearts to receive the encouragement that you have for us this morning. Heavenly Father, in all things, we pray that you would be with us, that you would bless us, that you would strengthen us, that you would encourage us. And we ask this in your name. Amen. We're going to sing another hymn of encouragement and, and optimism. It's 340, but nobody's got a book except myself. Um, it's Who Can Cheer the Heart Like Jesus. Again, let's stand. Soul is Jesus. 
seated. You know, one of the great things that we can do as Christians is not only pray, but pray together for things that are of concern and are on, on our hearts. And that's what we're going to do now at this part in the service. We're come, going to come to our loving Heavenly Father and bring to him the things that not only trouble us, but in many cases are beyond us. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who desires to hear the prayers of your people. You're interested. You're concerned. You share our griefs. You understand our worries. And Father, we thank you that you want to help us. And so, Father, we come before you this morning to bring before you situations that in many cases are completely beyond us. Uh, we can do very little, if anything, to influence their outcome. But nevertheless, areas in which we need your help. And Heavenly Father, we start by thinking about international situations and the prospect of wars and rumours of wars, not uh, in some distant part of the world, but on the continent of Europe. And so, Heavenly Father, we bring to you the situation that is developing around the Ukraine, uh, the threat of war, the reports of uh, the prospect of possibly an invasion of that country, and all the, the suffering and hurt that that might involve, not just to the nations involved, but its knock-on effect on other peoples and other countries. And Heavenly Father, we don't know everything that's going on behind the scenes, but Heavenly Father, we do pray for those who are involved in diplomatic activity, as well as those who will make decisions about whether troops go to war or not. Heavenly Father, we pray for cool heads. Father, we pray that people would not be caught up with, with bad emotions. Heavenly Father, we pray that people would be wise. And Heavenly Father, we pray that people will hold back from reckless action the results of which they cannot control. Heavenly Father, coming closer to home, we continue to live with the pandemic. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that in many ways the latest Omicron wave has, while more infectious, been less severe. We thank you that its effects have been less serious on many who've had the misfortune to contract it. But Heavenly Father, we are aware that the levels of infection continue to remain stubbornly high. And indeed, the level of infection in our own town of Worthing continue to be stubbornly high. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray for protection and safety of ourselves. Father, we pray that you would protect us from this infection, as well as those we know and those we love and the total strangers around us who share our community and share our county and share our country. Father, we pray for those who continue to try to understand what's going on. Epidemiologists, other specialist scientists who seek to understand the nature of the threat and to advise government and decision makers as to the right cause of action. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help them to give good, to give good advice at all times. And Father, we pray for those who receive advice that they would understand it correctly and act wisely. And Father, we pray for each one of us in the individual decisions that we make, and we pray for the leadership of this fellowship and other churches around the town as they decide what balance to strike between enabling people to meet openly and freely for worship and fellowship alongside keeping people safe in a responsible way. Heavenly Father, these decisions are far from easy, and we pray for wisdom for those who have to make them. And Heavenly Father, we, we also recognize that this pandemic has had knock-on effects and consequences, not least of all disruption to the supplies of stuff that we need and stuff that we want, and in particular to the supply of energy. And Lord, we notice that the cost of living is going up. And Lord, we recognize that that is going to be an issue for 
especially those on lower incomes. Life is going to perhaps become more difficult for them. The need to be canny and wise is going to become more important. And so, Father, we pray for those who are facing difficult choices. Lord, we pray that you would help them to be sensible and wise. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be at work amongst the forces that are bringing this cost of living increase uh, into existence. And Lord, we pray that you would calm them so that people would not suffer need uh, because of them. And Heavenly, Heavenly Father, in the midst of all this, we continue to pray for our government. In the midst of all this uncertainty both internationally and nationally heavenly father we recognize that the government is not having a particularly good time at the moment and i guess we've all got our theories as to the ins and outs of that but heavenly father we do pray that in those areas where there are questions about conduct truth would be revealed and understood and heavenly father we pray that perhaps these recent events would impress upon those who exercise leadership within our nation of the importance of not merely ability, but also integrity. That, Heavenly Father, we would be led by people who recognize that making the right decision is important, but being right people is even more important. And Heavenly Father, we pray for that. Heavenly Father, we think of our own MPs, Tim Lawton and Peter Bottomley, as they are a part of this whole process. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help them to act wisely in a time of confusion and uncertainty. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be with them as they seek to be uh, representatives of the community that live here in Worthing. And Heavenly Father, there are some things that are beyond the power of the government and Father, we think of the storms that are affecting people in Scotland and the north of England at the moment. Uh, the storm that came through yesterday and a further storm that is due to hit sometime today and perhaps the early hours of tomorrow. Heavenly Father, we do pray for especially the families and friends of those people who sadly lost their lives in Scotland and the north of England yesterday. Heavenly Father, bring comfort in the midst of this totally unexpected tragedy. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be with the electricity staff and others who are working in probably horrible conditions to restore power to many, many households. And Father, we pray for those who are without power and basic utilities. Uh, Lord, we heard the difficult stories of those who were the victims of Storm Arwen and the lengthy delays they faced before power was re restored in some cases, and the difficulties they faced because of that. And Father, we do think of and bring before you those who are facing similar problems and uncertainty at the moment. Heavenly Father, we do pray that power would be restored to them quickly, and they could start rebuilding their lives. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're concerned about all these issues that are beyond us, but Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are also concerned for situations that are immediate and local to us. And so, Heavenly Father, this morning we would also bring before you Angie, and Andrea and Rebecca and their care for Joan. We would continue to remember Peter King as he recovers. We commit Jonathan and Elaine to you as they adjust to life back in the UK. And Lord, for others within our congregation, those known to us, and perhaps those who carry burdens that we're not aware of, Heavenly Father, we lovingly commend them to you, knowing that while in some cases we may not understand and may not be able to help, by asking you for help, we are bringing them aid because you can meet their needs. <coughs> And so, Father, we commend all these things to you in our prayers, praying that you would work in these situations for good and for peace. Amen. 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 Before we sing again, Graham is going to come and read for us from the book of Colossians. Thank you.
Our reading is from Colossians 2, verses 16 to 23. Freedom from human rules. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what has been seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental forces of this world, why, as though you still belonged to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations, indeed, have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Thus saith the word of God. Graham, thank you so much for reading for us, and a big thank you to Dennis, who remembered that I preach from the NIV. So that's what we actually had for the reading uh, today. So that's great. Before we think about this particular passage of Colossians, we're going to sing again. Uh, it's, um, O Christ in you, my soul has found, and found in you alone, the peace that I had sought so long, the joy till now and unknown. You know, the thing about our Christian faith is it supposed to be about joy? And that's one of the things we're focusing on uh, during the course of our service. So let's stand and let's sing. Mm-hmm. 
If you've got a good memory, and you'll need one because it must be the best part of six months since I was last here, you'll remember that during my morning visits to West Worthing, uh, we've been looking at Paul's letter to the Colossians. Colossians is one of the shorter of Paul's letters. It was written to Christians living in Colossae, a a relatively small city in what is now modern-day Turkey. And the last time I was here, we looked at the middle part of chapter 2, from verses 6 to verses 13. And I suggested that you could sum up the message of that section, as well as this one, which which Graham read for us, and indeed perhaps the whole of the book of Colossians in the phrase, all you need is Christ. And in particular, the section from verse 6 to verse 15 as, all you need is Christ, So keep going. Uh, If you look back to verse 6 of chapter 2, you'll remember that Paul says, so that just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. You have received Jesus as Lord, so don't let yourself be distracted. Focus on what's important and keep going. Now, some people might listen to that and say to themselves, Well, that sounds like something of a burden. Now, it's true that, you know, don't be distracted, focus on what's important, keep going. Um, You know, isn't it all a bit gritted teeth? Um, Now, it is true that, of course, at times following Jesus can involve real effort and challenge. But the point that Paul wants to draw out in this section that Graham read for us is that following Jesus at its heart is liberating. It's not a burden, it's liberating. I mean, up until about two and a half years ago, I was a commuter. I used to travel most days between East Worthing and Aldrington by train. Now, of course, I didn't travel to Aldrington Station every day. There were holidays. There were some times when work took me somewhere else. And for the first few months that I was a commuter, I sometimes bought a monthly season ticket, and I sometimes bought a weekly season ticket. And I was constantly sort of trying to figure out ahead, well, you know, how often am I going to be travelling to Aldrington in the next four weeks? Quite a lot, I'd buy a monthly one. And if it was not all that often, I'd perhaps buy a weekly one, all in this effort to avoid paying for days when I wasn't actually going to be using the train. Uh, I guess it must be the Scot in me. But, you know, after a while of this, I shelved out and bought myself an annual season ticket. Now, I guess some people would gulp at the financial layout, but for me, it was liberating. Do you know why? I stopped worrying about it. You know, no more counting days, no more counting months, no more counting weeks. I forgot about it all. I was able to sort of focus on on other things, get on with my life. And that's Paul's point in this passage. You know, because all we need is Christ, if our lives and our attention is focused on Christ, there is a whole lot of stuff that we can stop worrying about. It's a whole lot of stuff that we don't need to be burdened by. We're liberated. It's not burdensome. All we need is Christ. So how come? Why is following Jesus so liberating? And for Paul, the answer is simple. You may remember, again, earlier in the chapter, the bit that we looked at six months ago in verse 8, Paul writes, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on either human tradition or the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Paul's concern was that Christians in Colossae were being made to feel worried and burdened by ideas and teaching that had nothing to do with God or Jesus and were based instead on what he calls elemental spiritual forces or human traditions. And you'll have noticed that, again, he used those phrases in verses 20 and 22 of our reading this morning. Now, I guess we all know about human traditions. While elements spell elemental spiritual forces suggest something, something darker, ideas that come from sources that are opposed to God and his ways. Mm-hmm. 
And what Paul is saying is that if we focus on Jesus, we don't need to be troubled by the world's answers to spiritual problems. But how were the Colossian Christians being troubled? Paul identifies two things that was actually sort of swirling around this Colossian church and causing this sense of worry and anxiety and burden. And the first of them was that people were becoming worried by what other people did. And Paul is saying, don't worry about what other people do. You can see that in verses 16 and 17, where he says, don't let anyone judge you. I guess there are very few of us who don't wonder from time to time what other people think of us. I mean, can you want us to put your hand on your heart and say, there hasn't been a time, some time or other, when you didn't say to yourself, I wonder what so-and-so thinks of me. I'm not going to ask you to answer that question, but, you know, you know it's true. Of course, you know, we worry if we're in work, we worry about what our boss thinks of us. From time to time, we may wonder what our neighbours think of us. If we have a slightly unusual hobby, we may wonder what other people make of it. You know, it's, it's understandable and natural. Rightly or wrongly, and sometimes our imagination can run away with us, we feel that others are judging the way in which we work or the ways in which we behave and finding us wanting. And of course, when we start worrying what other people think of us, the big temptation is to try and fit in with their ideas of how we should be going about our business, to live up to their expectations of us. And this seems to be the danger that was facing the Christians in Colossae. People were looking down on them, judging them, finding them wanting because they were not fitting in with their way of seeing things. And this was making this group of Christians feel inadequate and insecure and putting pressure on them to conform with what other people were doing. And Paul says, don't let anyone judge you. Now, in the case of the Colossian Christians, they were being made to feel inadequate because they didn't follow a particular set of religious practices and rituals. People were, in effect, saying to them, you would need to do Christianity the way we do it. Spelt out in verse 16. Uh, You've got it on the screen. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. It seems that there were a group of people hanging around the church who were teaching this sort of thing. Now, people have speculated about the exact nature of the teaching that these people were actually presenting. But from this verse, it's pretty clear that one strand of their teaching was that Christians needed to continue to follow the ritual and practices of Judaism and maybe a bit more beside I mean, the phrase, a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day, is a pretty good summary of Jewish religious practice, with its succession of high days and holy days. While the reference to what you eat and drink would seem to be a reference to Jewish dietary laws set out in the first five books of the Old Testament. It seems that what these people were saying was this, following Jesus is great, but you also need to carry following on all these ritual obligations and regulations and religious festivals. You need to do it all. And it looks as if they were actually going further than Judaism. It's interesting that they seem to have been pushing rules not just about what you eat, and the Old Testament was full of those, but also what you should drink. Now, interestingly, the Old Testament had virtually nothing to say about what you should or should not drink beyond the general comment that you shouldn't get drunk. And yet it seems that they had made people feel guilty, not only if they failed to follow Jewish food laws, but had had a few extra rules of their own. As Paul says in verse 22, these rules are based on merely human commands and teaching. And doesn't it remind you of Jesus' condemnation of the Pharisees? Piling on the rules, piling on the burdens, piling on the guilt. And Paul says, stop worrying about all this. Don't let these people get to you with their rules, requirements and regulations. 
But of course, some of Paul's opponents, people who disagreed with him, said, hold on, Paul. These food laws and all these religious ceremonies were given to the ancestors of the Jews by God. Who are you to say that they're no longer important or relevant? And Paul's answer is interesting. He doesn't deny that God gave those ritual laws to Moses and the people of Israel. But what he says is, you've actually failed to understand what they really are and what they're really there for. In verse 17, he describes them as a shadow of the things that were to come. Now, the thing about a shadow is that it's not real. We haven't got very many shadows in this room at the moment, so we've got no visual aids. But the thing about a shadow is you can see it, but it's not real. It's simply the outline of something that's real, projected onto a wall or the ground when it has a light behind it. It has no reality of its own. Turn off the light and it's gone. But that's not to say that a shadow can't be useful. I mean, imagine, for instance, that you're walking down a dark street with street lights, and you look ahead of you and you see that there's a sh- your shadow walking on ahead of you. You may find that reassuring, you may not. But if you see another shadow joining you, you know you've got company. And if that shadow is a lot bigger than your shadow, maybe it's a warning that perhaps you ought to be worried. I don't know. It depends on what sort of neighborhood you live in, I guess. As I say, shadows can not only tell you that something's there, but they can also give you a rough sense and a rough impression of what the thing looks like. But it's a very rough impression because it's not the real thing. It's, it's only a shadow. And this is the point that Paul makes. The Jewish ritual laws and regulations was just a shadow of the reality that was still to be revealed, that had been revealed in Christ. They only had significance because they pointed to the coming of Jesus. As he puts it, in, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however is find in Christ. The offerings set out in the Old Testament were, for instance, a reflection of the one genuine saving offering at the cross. The priesthood set out in the Old Testament was a foreshadowing of the priestly ministry of Christ. Now, it's important to understand that Paul was not saying it was wrong to follow those regulations. If you look at Romans chapter 14, for instance, you get the impression that Paul, frankly, wasn't terribly bothered one way or the other. But Paul's key point was that whether you choose to follow a particular food law or not, they have nothing to do with salvation. You're no better if you follow it. You're no worse if you don't. Avoiding particular foods, observing special ceremonies did nothing to win God's approval. And it was wrong and misleading to give them a value that they didn't have. As those teachers in Colossae were doing, impose them on others and make people feel in any way worried or burdened because they weren't following such practices. Now today, I guess, very few Christian teachers would urge people to follow Jewish dietary laws. There's probably one or two out there. I mean, you can find just about anything out there. Very rare. But maybe this false view of how we can please God just keeps bubbling up in new forms, with people still saying, you're not doing the right thing, and you're not doing them in the right way. I mean, to take a trivial example, you'll know as well as I do, that if you go into some churches and you're during the hymn, you put your hands up in the air, you'll be in trouble. Go to some churches, you'll be in trouble if you don't. If you go to a lot of churches, it all gets rather confusing. Now, that's a trivial example. But let's take a more serious one. Do you ever hear people saying something like this? If you were to enjoy the full blessings of God, you need to do this or do that or do the next thing. Now, Whatever practice they're actually recommending may possibly be helpful. 
It may be one that people have found beneficial and useful. But it's one something to say that here is something that you might find helpful in your Christian life. It's a completely different thing to say, to be a good Christian, you need to do this. With the implication, of course, that if you don't, you're not a good Christian. And sadly, sadly in places, this is all too common. And sadly, when it's used, it's the language that is in the same territory as Paul was speaking about in Colossians. Putting a burden on people, making people feel guilty if they don't fit in with what other people do and say that you should do. There's no shortage of people offering spiritual advice and guidance out there. If it's helpful, by all means, adopt it and make it part of your personal walk with Jesus. But don't let anyone judge you by what you do. And let's not rush to, bro- to judge our brothers and sisters if they don't find it as helpful as we do. Advice should never become a command. And that was what's happening in Colossae. And that's what Paul was concerned about because it was causing people to worry instead of enjoy their Christian commitment. Don't be worried about what other people do, but as well, don't worry about what other people say. We're moving on to verses 18 and 19 now. Paul talks about this. The focus shifts from people bossing others around to those who look to unsettle people and make a name for themselves about talking about their experiences, real or imagined. You'll remember that Paul describes this sort of person in verse 18 as someone who goes into great detail about what they've seen. You know the sort of person. The person who never stops talking, who aims to wear you out with his words. You may have met somebody like that. And again, Paul's message is, don't let people like that unsettle you. Now, what's striking about verses 17 and 18? 17 and 18 and 19 compared to 16 and 17 is that while Paul is talking about a slightly different issue he basically makes the same points first of all there is that warning not to let these unhelpful teachers make you feel inadequate in verse 16 for instance he said don't let anyone judge you in verse 18 he says don't let anyone disqualify you Now, the image is taken from the sports field with the idea of the referee or umpire showing you the red card for breaking the rules, telling you that you can't stay on the sports field any longer. Paul is saying, don't let these people tell you that you're not fit to be a follower of Jesus. Don't let them disqualify you. Don't let them tell you that you're disqualified and you have to leave the field because you're not good enough. You're not doing it the right way. You're not following the rules. Don't let anyone disqualify you. Secondly, there is that contrast between what's unreal and what's real. In verses 16 and 17, uh, Paul makes the contrast between shadow and reality. Here he describes these teachers as puffed up with idle notions. Has anyone here seen a picture of a puffer fish? Anyone know what a puffer fish is? They're extraordinary things. Um, when they feel threatened by a predator, they've got very flexible bodies and very flexible stomachs, and they basically fill their stomach up with water and literally blow up like a balloon, if you can imagine such a thing. They blow themselves up to balloon to make themselves look bigger and more threatening than they really are. They make themselves look impressive, but in reality, there's nothing there, just water. And it's the same story with these teachers who were troubling the Colossian church. Like the puffer fish blown up with water, they're puffed up with idle notions. They're like shadows. There's nothing really there. Their ideas like, lack substance and weight and value. And thirdly, there is this sense that they have lost touch with Jesus. In verses 16 and 17, they were focused on the shadow rather than the reality that's Jesus. Here, Paul speaks of them as having lost connection with the head, Jesus. 
Paul instead describes them as delighting in the worship of angels. Now, again, we don't know exactly what this involved because Paul doesn't go into the details. Obviously, the Colossian churches knew what he was talking about because they were having to deal with it. But we don't know the details. But again, while we may not know the details, we've got enough information to have a pretty good idea of what was going on here. These people were making the object of their worship and devotion not God the Father, not Jesus, not the Holy Spirit, but angels. How they did it, we don't know, but that's what they were up to. No wonder Paul could say they'd lost connection with the head. I mean, why worship angels and ignore the one who created angels? Why ignore the one who made you and focus on angels who didn't? In verse 19, Paul's reference to the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Now, that may be a reference to the idea that Jesus is the head of the church, but does not also suggest the idea of Jesus being involved in the creation and the holding together of all life. Why worship a created being when you can worship the creator. You know, it's interesting. In Colossians, Paul is constantly emphasizing the preeminence of Jesus. For instance, in chapter 1 and verse 16, he says of Jesus, for him in all things were created. 